Hey everybody, tonight's video is called The Branch and Root, and tonight we continue our pass-through study here in the book of Isaiah. We're going to look at the branch and root of Jesse, and we're going to see this chapter as a messianic prophecy pointing to Christ. And I know it's a shorter chapter, it's about 16 verses. Uh, just a heads up, our wrap-up, we're going to be going over quite a bit of New Testament scripture. So it's going to be a long video. In uh, chapter 11, verse 1, to start out, it says, There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. So the 586 B.C. captivity, the Davidic dynasty appeared as decimated as the Assyrian army. And a major difference between the two was the life remaining in the stump in the root of the Davidic line. And that life was meant to manifest itself in new growth in the form of the rod and branch. And Jesse, if you know your Old Testament genealogies, he was David's father through which the line of the Messianic king was to come through, as we can find in Ruth chapter 4, verse 22, and 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 1, and 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 12 through 13. And branch is the title for Messiah. In the last chapter, it ended with the Lord chopping down the proud as if they were mighty trees, which we looked at back on Saturday. But here, he looks over them as stumps and causing a branch to grow out of one of them. And a rod from the stem of Jesse emphasizes the humble nature that the Messiah would have. And we know that chapter 11 can be viewed for the messianic prophecy of Jesus. In verse 2, it says, The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. So the Spirit of the Lord came upon David when he was anointed king in Israel, Back in 1 Samuel 16, 13. So the Spirit of the Lord will rest on David's descendant, Christ Jesus, who we know will rule the world and is ruling the world. He's sovereign king over the world. And verse 2, to me, refers to the three persons of the triune Godhead. And wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and fear of the Lord are spirit-imparted qualifications that will enable the Messiah to rule justly and effectively. And fearing God includes obeying his command, His commandments out of faith that the Lord will keep his threats against his transgressors, as Proverbs 1, 7 states. And Solomon, he prayed for wisdom and understanding, if you remember back from the book of 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 9. And the seven-branched lampstand that held the lamp oil lamps for the tabernacle was also an illustration of the seven aspects of the Holy Spirit. In verse 3-5 through five it says, His delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he should not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor, and decide with equity for the meek of the earth, he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness and shall be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. So verse 3 are ordinary avenues for a king to obtain information needed to govern. But the future king will have supernatural perception beyond these useless sources. Uh, usual sources. And the Messiah will, will reverse Israel's earlier dealings with the underprivileged that we saw back in Isaiah chapter 3, verse 14 through 15 a few weeks ago. And the branches rule over the nations will be forceful. And the breath of his lips is another figure of speech for the Messiah's means of inflicting physical harm. And the belt gathered for the loose garments together, that's figurative speech for the Messiah's readiness for conflict. And righteousness and faithfulness are his preparation. And we'll discuss in the wrap-up how Jesus' delight is in the fear of the Lord. 
in verse 6 through 9, it says, The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatland together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, the nurse and child shall play with the cobra's hole, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So, verses 6 through 9, carnivore animals remade with natures that protect what they formerly would prey against, devour, effectively portray the wonderful peace on earth in the new age ruled by the Messiah. And the devouring nation such as Assyria will no longer assault God's people. And, you know, this is a eschatology type section of Isaiah. Premillennialists, they see this passage as future while eschatology stances see it as, or other eschatology stances see it as pointing to the church in figurative language. And in verse 9, everyone will know the Lord when he returns to fulfill his new covenant with Israel, as Jeremiah speaks of in Jeremiah 31, verse 34. And as I've mentioned before, Lord willing, we will finish this year in Jeremiah. And the millennial reign of the Messiah will be glorious. In verse 10 through 12, it says, And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, who shall stand as a banner to the people. For the Gentiles shall seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious. It shall come to pass in that day, that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time, to recover the remnant of his people who are left from Assyria and Egypt, from Pathros and Cush, from Elam and Shinar, from Hamath and the islands of the sea. He will set up a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from every, from the four corners of the earth. So the time for peace universally will come in the future millennial reign as believed by premillennialists. And the root of Jesse will also attract non-Jews who inhabit the future kingdom. And the first return of Israel to her land was from Egyptian captivity, as you can find back in the book of Exodus 14, verse 26 through 29. And the second will be from their worldwide dispersion. And in verse 11, we see an amazing promise that the Lord will lead his children from wherever they are distressed. And in verse 12 depicts the whole world as a figurative expression that the faithful remnant of Israel will return from a worldwide dispersion to their land. And the nations listed in verse 12 are geographically located on all sides of Israel and Judah. And to wrap up the chapter here, verse 13 through 16 says also the envy of a frame shall depart. And the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. A frame shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not harass a frame. But they shall fly down upon the shoulders of the Philistines toward the west. Together they shall plunder the people of the east. They shall lay their hand on Edom and Moab, and the people of Ammon shall obey them. The Lord will utter destroy the tongue of the sea of Egypt. With his mighty wind he will shake his fist over the river and strike it in the seven streams, and make men cross over dry shod. There will be a highway for the remnant of his people, who will be left from Assyria, as it was for Israel. In that day he came up from the land of Egypt. So Ephraim and Judah were two major divisions of Israel after the schism under Jeroboam, King Jeroboam in 1 Kings chapter 12 verse 16 through 20. And a frame represents the northern ten tribes and Judah, the southern tribes. And uh, premillennialists, they hold to the viewpoint that these two tribes, 
when they see the Mazar returns, they will reunite in a lasting peace. And for non premillennialists, they see verse 13 was fulfilled in uh, Ezra 6.17 and Ezra 6.35, if you want to check that out, when the remnant later returned to the land after the exile, the people offered sacrifices on behalf of the 12 tribes. And in that day, Israel will be free from foreign oppression and will be a dominant political force. And just as the Lord dried up the Red Sea and the deliverance from Egypt, the Lord in the future will dry up the Euphrates in connection with the final deliverance of his people. And we're going to look at that verse that passage in our wrap-up today where it's going to point to the Euphrates. And he'll divide up the Euphrates into seven channels. And the water of the Euphrates will be so shallow that people will be able to cross it basically barefoot or even with their footwear on without taking their shoes off, whatever. And Isaiah has much to say about a way for the remnant returning to Jerusalem throughout Isaiah's book ahead. And we're going to see it. And the Lord provides an image to confirm the certainty of his salvation. And just as he led his people out of Egypt, so he will lead them out of exile. And, you know, it's a big Jewish uh, holiday that just went by us, the Passover, where they remember the Lord bringing them, you know, God bringing them out of Egypt. It's a time of reflection. And so to wrap up here, we look tonight at the branch and root of Jesse, and we see the character of the king. And a stem sprouts forth from the stump of Jesse. And in verse 2, it shows the spiritual empowerment of the Messiah. And Jesus, he was of the spirit of the Lord, and he knew it. And I want to go over to our first passage of many, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. It says, But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. That as it is written, he who glorifies, let him glory in the Lord. So Jesus became for us, Jesus became for us the wisdom from God. And it isn't that Jesus has wisdom, Jesus is wisdom. And I want to go over to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15, 16 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are. Yet without sin, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So verse 15 and 16, Jesus understands all things and Jesus understands us perfectly. Jesus is perfectly suited as our sympathetic high priest in heaven. And Jesus has perfect counsel and power to do what he wishes to do. And Jesus knows everything and has knowledge, and we don't have everything of knowledge. And I know mankind that opposes God thinks they're really smart, that they just identified, you know, dozens of other genders and all that type of stuff. But Jesus holds knowledge that we don't know. Jesus knows what's in the sea. Jesus knows you know what on other planets we have we have we don't have full knowledge of everything that's out there as human beings and Jesus willingly kept himself in the place of submission respect and honor to his father in revelation chapter 1 verse 4 and we're going to see quite a bit of revelation as if you haven't noticed yet throughout our Isaiah study. Revelation chapter 1 verse 4. And it says here, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, 
and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So, Isaiah 11.2 is behind the term that we find here in the book of Revelation of the sevenfold spirit of God. It's not that there's seven, seven different spirits of God. But the spirit of the Lord has these characteristics. And I want to go over to John chapter 3 verse 34. John 3:34 says he for he whom God has sent speaks the words of God for God does not give the spirit by measure so Jesus received the spirit without measure and Isaiah 11 verse 3 through 5 shows us the perfect character of the Messiah and if you're still in John go over a chapter to John chapter 4 verse 34 it says jesus said to them my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work so nothing pleased jesus more than doing the will of his father and back to revelation chapter 19 and verse 15 so we're going to be all over the place here So Revelation 19:15 it says now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations and he himself rule them with a rod of iron he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of almighty God So the New Testament we see here uses verse 4 its terminology to describe the warrior king at his triumphant return to earth you know, at Armageddon. In Second Thessalonians chapter two, Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse eight says, And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. So Paul draws upon Isaiah eleven four to tell of the destruction of the man of lawlessness at Christ's second coming. In Isaiah 11, verse 6 through 9, it shows us the new eco ecology of the reign of the Messiah. Verses 10 through 12 shows us the new exodus of the millennial reign of the Messiah. And I want to go over to Romans chapter 15. Romans uh, chapter 15, verse 12 says, And again, Isaiah says, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he who, he who shall rise to reign over the Gentiles. In him the Gentiles shall hope. So the Apostle Paul saw God's ministry to the Gentiles during the church age as an additional implication of Isaiah 11.10. In Revelation 22, the very last chapter in the Bible. Revelation 22, verse 16. says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the, uh, in the churches. I am the root in the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. So we see that Jesus in the Revelation of John... Revelation twenty two sixteen, Jesus identified as the root and the descendant of Jesse. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 8, just a couple pages before, a couple chapters before it, Revelation 20, verse 8 says, we'll start with verse 7, Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison, 
and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is at is as the sand of the sea. So corners of the earth that we saw in Isaiah eleven twelve is used also in John's revelation. And we see that it means all throughout the earth. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 31. Matthew 24, verse 31. It says, And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So God's remnant will come from all of the known world. In the chapter 11, it ends with the peace of the reign of the Messiah. And I want to go over to Revelation chapter 16, verse 12. And uh, this will be our last New Testament passage that we're going to pass through. And so, Revelation 16, verse 12 says, And then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its waters dried up, so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. So, verse 15 of Isaiah 11, we see is very similar to this one here in Revelation with the judgment of the bowls. And I hope that this video is interesting to you and challenging. Eschatology is interesting and challenging. It is one of the highly debated things among believers. And as I always say, don't let eschatology bring disunity among you. You you can hold to, you know, pre-mill, post-mill, a-mill, uh, or if you're like me, I call it pan mill, where it all pan out. But don't let eschatology destroy relationships in the, the faith. It is a secondary issue in my thoughts. But, you know, you can have your thoughts. And I, I just hope that you continue enjoying the content here. And that if you uh, disagree with me, feel free to comment. I'm not going to attack you. You know, I'm, I'm actually studying all the different eschatology viewpoints when I can, you know, have the time at home and I'm not falling asleep in my chair at the end of long days. So thank you for hanging in there. And we'll see you next as we're going to be looking at the words from a worshiper. And I promise you the next video will be a pretty short video. So it's only six verses in chapter 12. So have a great rest of your evening. God bless.